Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Lorraine and Kathy for Ask a Crafter. And actually, first, I've got a question for you guys because I saved these. These were, well, here's one's folded up. It's a box of Joe from Dunkin' Donuts. And it took the, because it comes, um, it comes to like a bag. There's a bag inside. And I took the bag out and the cardboard was completely clean. And I'm thinking this might be something cool. Like, I don't know, like storage, make some storage with it or make, I don't know, some gift packaging or some things. Anyone, if anyone has any ideas of what I could use this for, do you girls have any ideas? Well, we had kind of talked a little, I thought it looked like the magazine, you know, racks yeah. or books, maybe not standard size, but that, and then it kind of looks like a house-ish. Yeah, I could almost do like rubber stamp pack, like new stamps and keep my new stamps instead of uh, a bucket. Yes. This would be flatter, yeah. probably be a little easier. Yeah. Yeah, I thought about maybe putting some yarn in there and feeding the yarn. Oh, yeah, the then you mentioned that. That's a good idea. You know, idea. then I could carry it kind of with me, carrying my box of yarn, not a box of Joe, box oh, of yeah. yarn. <laughs> that would be kind of fun. That'd be great. I have two of them, and I can fold them flat and tuck them somewhere until I get inspired. So, if you guys have any tips for me, please leave them in the comments below and give me some ideas because I, I can't I've never been a box that I didn't like I save <laughs> boxes I I'm know. sure there's some sort of support oh, group out there from box saver <laughs> oh my god I have so many cigar boxes I just I can't oh, yeah, I, got a bunch of I can't them. pass them up I don't and know what it is those cricket cartridge boxes I know I'm going to do something with those oh someday. yeah well, well oh, I gotta save those that's right because you, your cricket cartridges in that nifty little uh, yeah little I have tote. them all yeah uh, so yeah. you yeah. put them in the Anonymous. I think so. We might need that. Hoarder, craft hoarders, anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, That's man. They say if being a craftaholic is wrong, I don't want to be right. That's right. I'm yeah. happy. As soon as I start having mice crawl around in my stuff, then we'll know it's time to get an intervention oh, yeah. or something. Oh, dear. Yeah. Or stop leaving my studio door open so the animals can <laughs> wander in and out as they please. Oh, oh, what's our first question? Okay. Kathy Spears says, please explain gesso. I know someone who always gessos every art journal page before starting it. Oh, we kind of just answered. I understand the glare is partially for texture, as it has that grit in it, but what about the black and the white gesso? When do we use it and exactly what do we use it for? Is there any time you should never use gesso? Love you guys and thanks for doing this. I learn lots from all of you each time. From Kathy. Okay. Well, this is our first gesso question of the day. We get a lot of questions about gesso, and I think people think that if they're not using gesso, they're doing something wrong. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm not a huge fan of gessoing everything. I think it's an unnecessary step a lot of the time. Um, if your paper is buckling and wrinkling, or it doesn't seem up to the task of holding the media you wanna put on your page, personally, I find a different paper. Oh, that's me. Um, but you know, I can understand wanting to like, you know, alter a book, like find a, you know, a, a 25 cent book at a yard sale and yeah, you definitely need to gesso those pages because those pages are very absorbent. They're not going to hold your ink. Your ink is going to seep through and bleed to the back. So in that case, you need to gesso. Or maybe you found a sketchbook with really nice paper, but when you went to paint on it, your ink seeped through. It didn't stay on top of the paper. Then you need to gesso it. If you're using a watercolor journal or you're using like a mixed media pad, you shouldn't need to gesso it because it should have, the paper should be sized appropriately for those types of applications. So I would, you know, try the paper. If it seems like it's your ink is soaking through or you you can't get a nice long stroke with like your paint, like if you if you try to stroke acrylic paint across and it's like dry brushing almost, it feels like the, the paper is sucking up the paint, then you need to gesso to kind of give it a ground in which your 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 media can hang, hang on to and float across. So, you know, it, it, you definitely don't to gesso everything. Some people do gesso everything and they really see a lot of value with it. I use gesso when I make a mistake to cover up a mistake um, or if I've really botched a page or I don't like what I've done then I'll gesso over it and do something else on that paper to kind of save a paper but I generally... Can you generally gesso don't. over photographs? Sure. Like if you're want, I want to make a book on yeah. those hard children's books. Yeah. I want to put some photos in them for the mm -hmm. little kids. Yep. Yeah. And you gesso over them. Then that way all their fingerprints and stuff wouldn't 
<laughs> oh no, I wouldn't gesso them for that reason. Oh. I thought you meant maybe gesso part of a photograph to block it out and to put oh, the paint no. on. No, like it's for a board book, a board book would be yeah, great. No, like you could, um, oh, it's you not could, or not. Is you can get clear design? gesso, which is kind of like Mod Podge. Man, oh, um, what I think. what I think I would do in that case, I would gesso the board book pages, or I would peel off that glossy, um, the glossy uh -huh. pages, and then I would gesso the raw cardboard, and uh -huh. then do whatever you want to do, and then put your photos on. Um, and then if you want to seal it, I think I would use like a spray sealer, like maybe a cut Krylon oh, okay. and let it dry really well before you close up the book. Otherwise you're just going to have a glue together book. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, and like gesso will come in black. It generally, gesso, you gotta understand, was meant for painters, like to treat their canvases so that oil paint will oh. go through and rot them, or so that you don't waste so much acrylic paint. Because raw canvas is very absorbent, it's gonna, it's gonna be really hard to paint and get your your strokes to flow. So you gesso or prime your canvases, and so um, that's really what it was meant for. Black gesso would just be if you want to start start on a black canvas, kind of like a Bob Ross techniques. A lot of times, you would start on a black canvas. Um, clear gesso is pretty much like a PVA glue. It's like an acrylic because now gesso is, is all acrylic based So it's like a really flat toothy paint and it can be tinted You can tint your own white gesso make it whatever color you want with your acrylic paints um, But I, I think everyone's kind of gesso happy right now And I think people are doing it and not really knowing why they're doing it. They're just yeah. doing it because they like think they me. should Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought yeah. Should I? <laughs> I hear it so much. Yeah, I better gesso that <laughs> that's really... I'm lazy. I'm only gonna do it if it's absolutely necessary. I hate waiting for paint to dry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Grandma Grand Stovall. Grandma Stovall. Okay. Yep. Oh. I was just, just trying to figure out where to break that. Because um, I was like, Grandma's too wall. Too <laughs> anyway. Um, hi, Grandma. <laughs> so, while you were gone, I found a place in Canada to get inexpensive unmounted rubber stamps. I bought a lot. Is it important to use sponge between the stamps and the mount, which I plan to use tack it over and over instead of something permanent? I plan to use plexiglass. Next, I'm wondering what I should use to slightly melt the plastic to make a curved mount. What kind of spongy material? I have craft foam. I have a kiln, oven, heat gun, maybe a couple other options what? for melting. <laughs> <Where did laughs> I go? It's a dangerous grandma. <laughs> um, you don't need the cushion. If you're going to use tack it over and over, trim your rubber stamps really close so that you don't have the shadow or the ghost image around it. So you want to trim it really close and then paint your tack it over and over on the back. Let it dry till it's clear and then you can use it on any piece of plexiglass or plastic mount. If you're using regular plexiglass, not like a thick mount, you're going to be able to manipulate that and like you're going to really be able to squish it good and get a good impression. You do not need to curb it. So I wouldn't even bother with that. Try just stamping it on your regular plexiglass and see how well you do. I really don't advise heating up acrylic um, because you're going to release fumes. It's just, it's not a great idea. Um, and I know you will find tutorials on there because some people that work in acrylic making display cases and stuff will um, melt it. I haven't done that. I bought a um, Mega Mount from Impression Obsession, which is a big curved clear plexiglass block at six by six. I love that thing. And I also bought some from Crafters Companion, which are smaller. They're a lot cheaper too, but I couldn't get some of my really, really big stamps on it. So that's why I have both. The, the Crafters Companion ones are just fine and dandy. They just don't have it quite big enough for some of my larger stamps. Um, but I think if you're just using thin plexiglass, you're going to be able to get, it's, it's going to be flexible enough that you really press that stamp down. So you're going to be fine. Don't make more work on yourself. No. Yes. Okay. Kate Wetzel. Says, do you have any tips for finding the sweet spot when pricing? I try to price my handmade cards lower than designer boutique prices, but higher than mass marketed, unoriginal prices. When I'm selling in public, people seem to love my cards, but often they don't purchase anything. I would advise not dropping your price because if somebody, um, I think artwork is a very personal thing. I don't really think the price matters as much as long as you're in a reasonable range. So I would think a handmade card should go between, well, and I'm saying from my market, which is a small rural area, so it's not gonna be as much as if you're selling in the city, I don't think. Um, I sell my handmade cards from, um, some are as low as three, but generally from four to six dollars. Um, and then my watercolor cards, because watercolor is perceived as a more um, hard to learn skill, mm -hmm. then I just charge seven 
flat for those. Doesn't matter how long I spent on them, they're seven dollars, um, and that's that's what they are. And I, I find people will more likely pick up the cards before they even worry about the price, as long as the, you know, as long as you have it in a reasonable, you know, as long as you don't charge twenty five dollars for a card, I think that it's going to be acceptable. The sweet spot craft beer price there I have found to be five dollars. If somebody's going to pay three dollars, they'll pay five. Mm -hmm. If somebody's going to pay four dollars, they'll pay five. Then again, and, and I think then your next sweet spot would be ten dollars because I think if somebody is going to pay seven dollars, they'll pay ten. So I think I think five, ten, and twenty-five. Those seem to be the, the sweet spots in craft beer pricing. And I have I would say seventy-five percent of my stock on a craft beer booth would be five dollars because that is what people are ready to pay. They're not you know they're buying impulse items, they're buying gifts. And you yeah you'll spend five dollars. Like, oh yeah. yeah, and the thing is the perceived value on a on a handmade item is much higher. So if they if they buy they pay five dollars for a pair of handmade earrings and they give it to somebody, the person they're giving it to will probably perceive that this person paid fifteen dollars right. or paid more because it's right. a handmade item. Right. So you're working with the actual value and the perceived value. And these items that I'm selling for five dollars are items I can batch out really quick. So my handmade earrings, I can make you know I can make twelve pairs an hour. You know I can really batch those out. And if I find things that aren't selling, um, I don't lower the price. Mm -hmm. I will, I'll give it a few craft fairs just to see if maybe the market was wrong. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll grab bag it. And I'll put like, I'll make sure that there's at least two to three times the value of a grab bag. So if my grab bag is $5, I'll make sure I have at least $15 worth of stuff in there. And that's what I do with my stuff that has not been moving. I do not discount my prices because I think that says I don't feel confident right. in what I am selling it for. And that also tells people that I might sell this to you for $10 and turn around and sell it to you for $5. So I do not discount my prices. I will honor, I will, um, um, give a better deal to my better customers by saying buy two get one free you know that's giving them a better deal um, without dickering but it's also you know so they're getting they're spending more so they're getting more you know so that's that's kind of how I do it. I don't discount my prices I don't put things on sale I you know this is my price this is a fair fair price for it and I believe in that price so that's kind of my thoughts on craft beers. You guys have yeah, any? Yeah, no, no, that's I good. That's true. Agree. <laughs> yeah, because I have to say, as far as you know, selling it for ten and then you know, change, change your mind and going down. I mean, I feel that way about because I'm a sewer about patterns. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, patterns are eighteen dollars. It's the regular price. However, they're forty percent off all the time. Well, if you can have them forty percent off all the time, yeah. and just have that be their regular <laughs> price, yeah. if if no one's going to buy them for eight dollars, mm -hmm. obviously, if you can have them. 40% off all the time, they don't cost you that much to make, mm -hmm. right. and just put them at a reasonable price so mm -hmm. people will be happy to buy them instead of feeling like they're constantly ripped off. Yep, and if people know you do that, they're just going to wait till the end of the show when they're coming over to your booth and right. say, okay, can I pay a dollar for this? You know, just just stop that right off the bat by not putting yourself on sale, just, you know, give a give a reward to those that buy a lot, but, you know, the price is the price, and that's, that's that. Okay, uh, next question, Christian Gali. Asked, I was wondering if you had advice on meeting other crafters or finding new crops in your area. All right, that's kind of tough because I always find out by word of mouth. If you do have a craft store or a, uh, if, especially if you have a local craft store because they rely on classes to bring in new mm -hmm. people, um, ask them and see if they, if they don't have one, they may know of one. Um, if you belong to a church or a library or any group like that, ask them. Like guilds and yep. gar garners guilds mm -hmm. and homemakers guilds and mm -hmm. churches, yeah. Yep. You can search online. Um, one great thing to do is like, it was, I saw a sign for the Anna Temple Shriners Craft Fair. Mm -hmm. And when I was driving on the, the down to visit my parents the other day, and I'm like, oh, I got to remember that. I went online, searched it, couldn't find it. Went to the Anna Temple website, couldn't find it. So I went on Facebook. I'm like, hey, anybody know about the Shriner uh, craft fair that's November 1st? And um, then I tagged a friend of mine who I know whose dad is a Shriner, and I got a message right back with a contact mm -hmm. number. So searching on Facebook, hey, anybody know of any crops right. this weekend or anybody know of any uh, scrapbooking groups? You will find people, especially you'll find like demonstrators, like. Local, up people local newspapers too. Yep, local newspapers. Like, town, like in the you know classified ads mm -hmm. or whatever, they might they might list some stuff with the church get together. Things. Community calendars on uh, TV stations. Just search it because most TV stations and papers will have their community events online. And uh, yeah, that's any other tips. Meetup.com. Oh yeah, that really really does work. You, you've never met any weirdos or anything like that. No, because you have uh, you know you meet someplace like you know in a store or in yeah you know I don't think I'd go to somebody's home yeah unless I knew somebody that mm -hmm. knew them yeah. but it's all pretty open at civic centers and things like that oh nice oh yeah I've never tried that out oh yeah it's very good 
Okay, Amy X231, you have both water-soluble oil pastels and watercolor crayons. Do they work differently or are they pretty much the same thing? They're awfully close, I have to say. Um, a water-soluble oil pastel is going to be a little greasier, though, and a watercolor crayon is going to be a little harder. But they're both very opaque. Um, they both will lay down. Actually, I wanted, I had taken a class on using the Crayon Dosh watercolor crayons, but they're so expensive. And I found the Portfolio water-soluble oil pastels, and I was able to pretty much substitute those, because you can get a pack of 24 of those for like 8 bucks, 8 to $10, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. And then I collected, and then I grabbed a few few of the Karen Dosh crayons because you can like sharpen them and get a more detail and and stuff um, and then finally when I realized I really liked the Karen Dosh and I would use them then I, I invested in a big set when I found a really good price probably about 15 years ago um, but yeah you can you can swap them out they're not that different and gelatos and the water soluble oil pastels I would reckon are 98 percent the same thing so huh. yeah oh, okay. Cardiff Crafter. Cardiff. Yay, oh, Anthony. can't wait. <laughs> My question, how, if possible, would you go about making your own Wink of Stella pen? Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Um, that's a, you know what I would use if you can find them, instead of that would be the Twinkling H2Os. It's kind of like they took the Twinkling H2Os, a col it's like color and shimmer, oh, really? and put it into a pen, hmm. like a brush pen. But I think that you would be so much better to go to the dollar store, buy a pot of the, the, the clear... A sparkle or the white sparkle eyeshadow or get a get a silver a pearl actually the pearl they make one called micro pearl pearl x oh my computer's talking to me um <laughs> get a little pot of the of the micro pearl pearl x and then get some watercolor paints any watercolor paints or if you have stamp pads already use those you can just you know take your stamp pad smoosh it onto a piece of plastic and get a little puddle of color. Um, Take your, you know, mix a little bit of Pearl X in there with you, a little bit of glue. Use that. Make it as you need it. I that's the Wink of Stella pens are expensive. I would think that they would clog. Just I don't know. That I've that never used them, but I've issue with yeah. them. I mean, maybe maybe but not. Like a brush I, haven't, tip. I still haven't done them, but I just would think that it would. I think they're kind of like a water brush, though. Really? I think that's what keeps mm. them from clogging. But they're super expensive, and I would, I so would it just doesn't mix hard into it. Like, I guess I, would I think, think it's it would like a liquid. I think it's hmm. so it's probably really not that much product because yeah. you look at a pot of twinkling H two O's, it will last you forever, well, right. quite a long time, and you know you get all that color and you get all that that shimmer. I'm not sure they're still in business though. They they seem to go in and out of business all the time. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and Niji makes a really excellent watercolor palette. It's like six bucks. You can get it at Oriental Trading. Um, most probably pretty much anywhere. I know they have them for six bucks at Oriental Trading and it's got like 24 beautiful colors. Just all you need is a round paintbrush and a jug of water. I mean, <clears throat> and so for like six bucks, a price, less than the price of one pen, you have 24 colors. So I would do that, honestly. Yeah. He's in the UK though. If you're in uh, the UK and you know of a very similar product, could you please leave a link below for Cardiff Crafter, Anthony, because um, I'm thinking of United States products. <clears throat> and I know you guys have a little more limited resources over there, so if you have uh, something you can share, a link you can share, please leave it below, and that would be very helpful. Okay. Lily Lightly, Lighty, says, I have two questions to ask. I have made some buttons and baked them. I didn't want to risk ruining them by adding holes, but now I'm lost on how to add shanks. These are going to be sold on my store, so they need to look professional. You can drill them. You can drill baked polymer clay. Um, you do a small bit. Even if you need a bigger hole, I would start with a small bit, drill it, and then go in with a bigger, yes. a bigger bit. Um, and then they have, at, at, um, I'm not sure where you're located, Lily, but at Harbor Freight, they have a cute little drill, and it's got the little, little boring, but it's got little polishers. It's awfully cute, oh. and it's like it goes on sale for six dollars or six ninety nine or something all the time. Um, so you could, you could definitely drill. It'd be powerful enough to drill those little holes and polish them up and stuff. Um, do you know if you can get shanks, just the shanks? Well, the I'm buttons? trying to think if I, if I've seen them because I I almost feel like you have that they're like yeah. metal yeah, like a metal think. plate yeah, like yeah. almost like ring blanks and yeah. stuff like mm -hmm. that and you would just glue it on the back right. but I don't know who the you know who might have them? Um, SoTrue.com. Oh, yeah. It's a, the, the, it's a company that's been around making zippers in New York for like hundreds of years. Uh, Zipper Stop is there. Is there? They have a couple of websites. But, oh, uh, um, and the button making kits too. I don't know how yep. feasible financially it is, you know, to to buy them. But of course, where you do the cloth covered button and stuff, yep, you can that has like the snap on 
oh, the yes. snap on back that would have. Yeah, you want to use like a, a five minute epoxy on that though because you really need a strong bond. Um, I think you'd be better off to do buttonholes just because yeah, trying to glue something so onto too. something that's already yeah. made um, is a little iffy if you it's are going to add glue it. more weight and bulk. Yeah. And it might flop. It might flop forward. It might not if stay it's flush. Too heavy. Yeah. 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 I would I would do drilling with the uh, with mm -hmm. the small Dremel oh, or yeah. even the cheap Harbor Freight thing. If you're if you have a Dremel, if you have a friend or a husband or boyfriend or something with the uh, with the Dremel, go ahead and go ahead and sneak that out for a while. I'm always borrowing stuff across the across the way from my husband's <laughs> shop. <laughs> <laughs> and the good second, stuff over there. <laughs> the second question is: I have normal polymer clay and was wondering if it worked for making stamps. Um, you're not going to get it written, but you could end up with some really cool grungy textures that way. There's a clay called Bacon Ben Clay, which is really good for doing that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. The the softer the clay is to work with, the harder it's going to be generally. When it after it cures, bacon ben clay is kind of tough to work with. It's kind of dry and oh, yeah. and hard to those. blend. This is made of. Is that made with the bacon bed? I don't know what she used, but she did something. She and I've oh, done I thought it, it was metal. That's cool. So did I. No, oh, and, and cool. I've made a, a bunch of stamps with. Um, well, I don't know what I use. Would it be sculpty? Could be sculpty. Are they hard or are they soft? They're hard now because I baked them. Yeah. But they come out really nice. Do they really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are they for stamping clay or for stamping paper or? The stamps? Yeah, what do you use them to stamp I just with? use regular stamps. Really? I have a nice, couple nice horse ones that I did for horse people. And you just, and you can stamp it and get a good impression? Oh, yeah, beautiful. Oh, well, awesome. Are you using pigment or? And then sometimes just take some paint and, uh, you know, what's it yeah. called? Boss it where it just goes in the cracks and like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With some paint, what's it called? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but I just do stamps. Okay, okay. Lorraine says that yes, you can use regular clay for making stamps. Or I was a doubting Thomas, and Lorraine set me straight. Oh, so okay, go for it, ago. Lily. <laughs> Sounds good. You just try something and see if it's gonna yeah. work. <laughs> you can ask her if you have any further questions upon that subject. Oh no. <laughs> I'll just put her email right yeah. below. You guys can all contact Lorraine. She'll be happy to help. <laughs> I think they see I'm clueless. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen Hayes, is there any primer that can be used for ink tents pencils so that they can be used in a journal made of copier paper? I'm in the letter journal swap and the paper has to be light so as to not to be too costly to mail international. I'm pretty sure it is no, but if anyone has a fix, it would be you. Oh, let me take a look at that question again because I was concerned about the time and I was paying She wasn't <laughs> listening. <laughs> oh, a primer. Oh, this sounds like another gesso question. Um, gosh, I think by the time you add layers of primer or gesso to your copy paper, gonna be, yeah. it's going to be as heavy. heavy. Yeah. yeah, and brittle. You know, I think that that would make it quite brittle. So as it's being sorted through and, yeah, and nailed, I think it's going to crack. And everything, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think. What if you did. Do you think cloth might be oh yeah uh, lighter? Maybe she made a book out of cloth, muslin, or something. Mm. And maybe if like when you're making your pages, maybe you put a silicone mat under it, and you could gesso that, and then um, do all your work to it, and then you'll have. I would think. I don't know. That might be heavier. I'm not sure. I think gesso and copy paper. It's gonna wrinkle and curl and be brittle. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think it will crack like like what you said, but I, I don't know that the fabric would would be much much lighter really. you know what would work um that yupo paper the synthetic paper from japan uh, it's yeah, really thin it's um it's a pvc mm -hmm. i believe isn't that mm -hmm. really expensive it's not that with? bad it's not that bad i think it's about a couple dollars two dollars for a sheet but a sheet is like 40 by 60 or something it's oh, huge oh, you can make a whole that's journal a you yeah, can make yeah. a whole journal you cut that down um yeah and it doesn't tear and it's flexible so you could put it in like a, a bubble mail or a priority mail yeah. envelope and it should go fine I think I would think I would do that. Yupo, Y U P O, and I know Blick has it. You try Cheap Joe's and Jerry, see who has the best price, and um, and order it there or Amazon probably. But you know, I'd, I'd look those those three places definitely to make sure you're getting the best deal. Okay, this one Irene Reed says, can you do a video on how to set up a blog and what are the best companies? Well, also hints for doing videos. I think I might uh, tackle that in its own. Um, 
in its own. Actually, let me let me take that question and add it to my clipboard. I think because there's so many different things like mm -hmm. about blogging that I would like to cover, I'm gonna do its own video on that. Actually, by the time this video comes out, the blog video might be done. So oh. go to my channel, check out check that out because I'll, I'll be doing that right off. I had the idea to oh. also do a do a thing on blogging because I get asked a lot about starting a blog right. and a YouTube yeah. channel. Yes, I do. Oh. So I think it's a wonderful outlet for people to share their crafts and to feel a little more confident about their stuff. Oh, so yeah, it's good. stay tuned. Check my channel right now. It might be there. Is on the uh, back to the primer question yeah. on the copier paper. Could you do something like hairspray or just the spray like shellac glosses? Would that like, or would it just soak and wreck the paper? I think it's going to make that it brittle. Would be brittle. You think it would I make think it too brittle? I think especially shellac because I think because shellac tends to it, it's tends brittle, to be brittle anyway. But it's I was just thinking of surface. like the spray gloss or like doing it with a hairspray if that would kind of seal it enough. I think them. it might yellow it even too. Yeah. So I think yeah. I would go with the Yupo paper if you want a super light, durable surface that doesn't need to be primed. So you know, okay to save top. weight. Well, you know what? I think we've actually gone a little long, so might as well just let it roll. You know, I gotta slice it. I gotta slice it slice together it. on the computer anyway. So, little you, bonus, bonus stopwatch. stopwatch. You don't have your stopwatch. Yeah, on. I'm I'm just uh, scattered today, scatterbrained. <laughs> okay, so the the dagget looks like it, it says I have been told that alcohol marker blender pens are filled with just alcohol. If this is the case, can I refill them with just alcohol? And what type or types of alcohol can be used? Thank you in advance. You're welcome. You need denatured alcohol or ethanol. Uh, rubbing alcohol is not strong enough. It's diluted with some water or something. It's not. It's not 100% pure alcohol. Um, but if you use ethanol, if you can find it, that's probably the best. Did you hear that? Yes, I was just. Trying. She kicked. Oh, the box. I was thinking. I was, like, <laughs> I was trying it was to over there. easily move the box out of your way so you didn't. Oh no! I thought there might be. I thought there might be a squirrel yeah. or something. No. <laughs> Is, uh, which is perfect. That's what the po the Copic blending solution is. But it's hard to find because uh, people would drink it. Uh, so denatured alcohol is ethanol with a poison added to it. So you can sell it at hardware stores and whatnot. And people can't drink it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you get one swallow and you, you throw gin. it up or something. Maybe you could use gin. I don't know. I know uh, gin gin's probably more expensive than yeah. uh, than yeah. uh, denatured alcohol. I use denatured alcohol. The only thing you want to be aware of if you use denatured alcohol is not to spray apply it because you don't want that poison in the air to breathe. That's why they tell yeah. you not to spray apply the Tim Holtz alcohol, Adirondack alcohol inks. Oh. Because cause I was doing that, I was using it with my airbrush. I'm like, this is fantastic. This I love the look. And people are like, stop, you are going to die. Stop spraying that and breathing it in. I'm thinking, I feel awesome. What are you talking about? <laughs> Spring metal colleagues. So that's why, um, like, you've got companies like Copic that have the autom the uh, ABS system, that brush, uh, airbrush system. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use one of those systems, don't use the um, denatured alcohol in your markers. And that's the other thing. I don't really approve of um, of people using rubbing alcohol in their spray mists because you're spraying that, and that's the same situation where they yeah. put an additive into that alcohol so you don't drink it. So I can't imagine it's so good to drink it. Yeah. yeah, and water works just fine. So, I mean, you may get a little wrinkle on a paper, but I'm usually not spraying anything that much and I'm soaking it down. Mm -hmm. um, so there's my two cents. Let's do one more question and then um, then we will wrap it up because okay. we've already gone long, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Okay. Maria Bayless says, my question is, how do you make homemade paste? There's a couple different methods, and um, if you Google homemade paste recipe, homemade paste recipes, you'll come up with a few. But a couple I'd like to mention um, would be um, you can use gelatin to make a homemade paste or glue, and you would reheat it. You'd make it and you put it in your little jar, and then when you want to use it, you have to heat it up, and then you get a, you get a really strong non-toxic glue. Um, so it would be appropriate for you know using for labels or using on you know cupcake toppers or whatever. Um, not that people eat cupcake toppers, but in case you're, you know, you're worried about that. Um, you could also use corn and a cornstarch. You can make a paste out of cornstarch. And I think it, it is less likely to mold than a wheat paste. I don't know why exactly. Uh, but like the yes paste is corn based. 
like the yes paste that mm -hmm. I like to use and it's it's acid free um, as far as I know I don't know if your homemade the, the yes paste is acid free on archival I don't know if your homemade one would be I don't know if they've done anything special to that uh, but you could search for a corn paste recipe and of course we paste your what you might make masks or paper mache out of which is just you know the flour and water paste and that reminds me of Rita Rudner's joke if you uh, how could if you mix flour and water together you get glue but if you add eggs you get cake <laughs> <laughs> Was get blue whenever I try to cook. I don't know. <laughs> but there we go. You got to end on a joke. Mm, that's good. That's yes. very good. Uh, I want to thank you so much for watching today. Please leave your questions below and we will try to answer them on one of our upcoming uh, episodes of Ask a Crafter. And if you want more Ask a Crafter episodes, check below for the Ask a Crafter playlist and you can be entertained for days on end with yeah. our <laughs> lovely, lovely banter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for watching. Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Until next time, happy crafting. <laughs>